All right. Hello and welcome everyone to FAIR's uh, free monthly webinar series. My name is Lynn Hewen. I'm FAIR's National Director of Education Initiatives as well as your moderator for today's presentation on psychosocial aspects of food allergy among adolescents. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this presentation is intended to provide specific strategies and tools to parents and caregivers of adolescents living with food allergies. So while some of the presentation content may be helpful for adolescents who are living with food allergies, it's important to note that the presentation will not be directed to this audience. However, if you happen to be a teen or a young adult with food allergies listening in and you want to ask Dr. Herbert questions at the end of the session related to managing anxiety, bullying, social issues, or anything related to, um, to your food allergies, uh, you are certainly welcome to do so. This presentation will be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in about seven to ten days. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all of our attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. We'll have some time for moderated questions at the end of the presentation, and you may submit questions throughout the broadcast, and they'll be uh, presented as time permits. Because you will be muted, we ask that you please submit these via our questions feature, which is in your GoToWebinar panel on your screen. For those of you who are on Twitter, we encourage you to join us in conversation today during the, our broadcast, and you can follow along with our webinar live tweets at our handle, at foodallergy, or the hashtag fairwebinar. All of FAIR's resources and education programs, including our webinars, are made possible through community support. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible gift or become a FAIR member to advance our mission efforts, you can do so at foodallergy.org forward slash donate. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Glenda Jones Herbert, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Health at Children's National Health System in Washington, D.C., and a licensed clinical psychologist in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Virginia. She is the director of the Division of Allergy and Immunology's Psychosocial Clinical and Research Programs. Dr. Herbert's research interests include the identification of medical and psychosocial factors related to food allergy management and the development of clinical interventions for youth with food, with food allergies and their families. Dr. Herbert is a board member of the Maryland Psychosocial Psychological Association. At this time, um, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Herbert, and I'm very excited to have her with us today. So, thanks, Linda. Thank you so much, Lynn. I'm really happy to be here with everyone today. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart as I work every day with kids that have food allergies clinically, and um, I'm really dedicated to doing research with our population here as well. So I have a few objectives to get through today. Um, the first one is to address a little bit about who pediatric psychologists are, because I recognize that it can be a unique phenomenon to have a psychologist that is embedded within a hospital system and to have a psychologist that specializes in food allergy. We also are going to be talking a little bit about why adolescence is such a challenging developmental stage in general, but also how that relates to food allergy. And we're going to cover some of the common psychosocial concerns that adolescents with food allergy present with. And some of this is based just on my clinical impressions, having worked with a lot of teens with food allergy, but it's also based on research among this population. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we can address some of these concerns. And I have two case examples that I plan to review that indicate how um, in therapy someone like me might work with a teen with food allergy. And at that point, then, we'll be able to take some questions. So first of all, who exactly are pediatric psychologists? Um, people like me are psychologists who have been trained to specifically work in the healthcare field. And I have been specifically trained even more, um, more um, narrowly to work with children and families in a healthcare setting. The goal of pediatric psychologists across the board is to work with families and children in order to address psychological aspects of illness and injury. And this can range from something like an acute injury if someone presents to the emergency department with a concern or if children are in the hospital for a short amount of time with a burn, um, they need treatment for that. But it also covers more broad illnesses that are more chronic, like food allergy or type 1 diabetes or cancer. 
um, cystic fibrosis, things like that. And our goal ultimately is to promote healthy behavior in children and families as they're adjusting to their illness or to their injury. One of the aspects of this that is particularly important is that we use a developmental framework. So all pediatric psychologists are fundamentally trained in child development before we learn anything else about health or concerns related to health. And the reason for this is that we make sure when we work with families that we're accounting for things that are developmentally appropriate. Um, examples of this could be that when we talk to children about illness or about injury, we use words that make sense and that are appropriate for a young child versus an adolescent versus a parent. Um, similarly, we constantly are thinking about transitional periods and the way that that may affect adjustment to illness as well. So I'm sure you all um, can recall that the way that you helped your child with food allergy when he or she was a toddler is very different than the way that you work with a child um, that is an adolescent with food allergies. So this is a constant framework that we are attending to. Another thing that's really unique about pediatric psychology is that we work within a multidisciplinary team. So you might find some psychologists in private practice who might work with other psychologists in their field or who might work with psychiatrists. And I definitely work with these individuals as well. But a big part of what pediatric psychologists do is work with medical individuals and schools and nutritionists, a lot of different people who are relevant to child care. And the goal of this is so that we can all come together to, to really encourage overall child well-being rather than working in silos where we don't know what the other is doing. Ultimately, most pediatric psychologists engage in clinical work. So for me, I do therapy one-on-one -on -one with children and families, um, but I also do consultation liaison work, which means going to medical appointments, going to oral food challenges, and seeing how families are doing. And then we also typically engage in research. And I, I am a clinical researcher, which means that I am regularly researching aspects of food allergies that I can then apply to my clinical work to make sure that what we're doing is evidence-based. We also advocate for public policy, so you might find psychologists getting involved with um, ensuring that children have access to what they need in school, such as epinephrine auto injectors. And um, you also find that I do things like this, where I talk to you know, with the public and try to educate. So all of those things are, are represented in pediatric psychology. So let's think then a little bit about emotional reactions to food allergy. Um, some of these might seem very poignant to you, others may not, and all of that's okay. All of this means that you are a very normal person. Frustration and stress and worry, these are things that we hear all the time. Perhaps parents and children feel frustrated with the way that food allergies are managed outside of the home, perhaps at restaurants or in school, in daycare settings, when traveling. Um, these things might end up resulting in feelings of stress, having to plan ahead, having to constantly be thinking, um, you know, what is that, what is the other person prepared to do to help my child or not prepared to do. And this also can bring up worry as well. Worry about the future, worry about uh, what will happen if your child has an allergic reaction, etc. Anger, sadness, anxiety, these things all come up as well. Anger, frustration, they definitely are wrapped together sometimes. Um, sadness is something that comes up a lot too. We have kids that might express sadness that they can't do the same things as their peers um, based on their food allergies. We sometimes also find that kids might feel sad that their food allergies persist. Some of our teens will tell us that they envision that their food allergy would have um, gone away by now or they may have developed tolerance and they feel sad about that. And anxiety, of course, ties into worry. Um, there's also a lot of confusion. So some families during that initial diagnosis stage are very confused, um, but they might also become confused at later times. So say you are approached with the possibility of completing an oral um, immunotherapy trial, that might be a very hard decision. You might not feel like you have as much information as you need, um, and then there's no clear answer. That's where uncertainty can also come in. So when you have to make medical decisions, you might not necessarily know what the best direction is to go in. And the thing about all of this is that these are all really normal. And there may also be times when you and your child 
um, and siblings and other family members really feel okay with food allergies. And that doesn't mean that there is something wrong with you. It's, it's also a normal reaction. So I, I want to validate these feelings and really help you um, to feel that it's okay to have them. We never want to downplay someone's emotion. Instead, we want to understand it and then help them cope with that and help them move forward. So there is um, a pretty standard adjustment. If we think about a model of food allergy adjustment, this mirrors a lot of adjustment models and other chronic illnesses. Um, so we know that first there is an allergic reaction, or there may be um, concern of an allergic reaction because an older sibling has a food allergy. And this is a time that can be incredibly um, traumatic for some families, that can be stressful, and it can be stressful for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that if the family has never seen an allergic reaction, just witnessing it can be scary. Um, another is that parents sometimes tell us that if they were the one that gave their child the food to which he reacted, that they feel stressed or guilty about that. Um, alternatively, if the first reaction happens at daycare or school, parents might be stressed because they weren't there for that reaction. They didn't see what happened. They didn't know what was going on. Um, so you can you can imagine and think back to you know, your own experiences about why that first reaction was hard. The diagnosis period then is also such a period of adjustment. And for some families, diagnosis happens very quickly. And so that period of uncertainty is um, quite small. But for other families, diagnosis is a meandering course or just takes much longer than they would hope. And there are a variety of reasons for that. It may be that it takes a long time to get results from blood work. It may be that it takes a long time to get an appointment. But it also could be that the food that, that your child reacted to was a very complex food with respect to ingredients, and it's just not clear what exactly they were reacting to initially. Um, so this diagnostic period can have ups and downs, and it's definitely a point of stress. And then there's initial food allergy management. So our, our allergists, especially the ones I work with, they really try to do their best to give families as much information as they need up front to give them that initial knowledge. But we recognize that we're really giving families a lot of information, and it can be hard to digest in one clinic visit. And it can be hard to digest even in a week. So there is this period of time during which families are trying to adjust and trying to set a new normal. And that can be hard for a variety of reasons. Things like, um, say a family is very busy at night and typically doesn't make dinner themselves, perhaps they get carry out, well, that might be something that needs to be adjusted. Or say that the food that the child um, is now allergic to is something that's a staple in the household. Families that then have to decide what to do about the presence of the allergen in the home um, have to will spend some time trying to figure that out. And it's not uncommon for parents, um, for caregivers, partners, whoever, to disagree a bit on how exactly they want food allergy to be managed. So that in itself can be a point of stress. And then the initial um, communication with school can take some time, and it can take families a while to understand how to advocate for their child in school. Then we find stable disease management periods. So there may these may be the times when you say, all right, I do feel kind of okay um, with where I am with things. And you kind of forget in some senses that, um, that food allergies ever were not something that were present in your life. Um, especially I find this among our families of kids who have been diagnosed during infancy. They say, you know, this is all I've ever really known. So this is how it is. And we are comfortable with that. But that of course, doesn't mean it's not hard. There still are many things that have to be done every day. Um, it's just that some of the uncertainty about how to manage food allergies may be a bit less salient. But then, even among or even during these stable disease management periods, there are still cycles of uncertainty. And these are things that might come up that then cause the family to have to reassess what it is that they're doing to manage food allergies that might make them question perhaps how they've been doing things and can be a huge point of stress. And many times it is these events that um, prompt families to come in to work with the psychologist. So for example, 
um, an allergic reaction. So say you've been very comfortable for years having had an allergic reaction occur in many years, but then suddenly one does happen and the child has to go to the emergency department, has received epinephrine, um, that can all be very scary. And even children who aren't typically anxious kids might experience anxiety afterwards and therefore seeing someone like me or another psychologist um, can be really helpful at this point. Finding out about new allergies or getting new information about food allergies can also be stressful. There's always a balance, I think, um, with respect to informing yourself via social media, like Facebook groups and things like that, because families can be really sensitive to all the information that they're given from these other parents. Um, and so finding out information about what's going on in other countries or what's going on in other parts of the United States can be hard for families. Oral food challenges are another point of uncertainty. And for many families, these are a real positive thing in the sense that they will get new information about their child's food allergy, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't come with stress. So perhaps having the food challenge and knowing that a reaction might happen is very stressful. Um, and that's another point where I see a lot of families, we either prepare for food challenges or we'll have team members that go into food challenges to assess in the moment how families are dealing with it. After a food challenge, food reintroduction can also be a period of uncertainty. Even if the child passed the food challenge, it's not uncommon for parents or children to feel a little bit hesitant to eat a food once they get home again. And um, among really young kids, they might it might not have anything to do with anxiety about the food. It may just be that they don't like the flavor or the taste, and it's challenging for families to incorporate these foods into their diet. And then, um, as a pediatric psychologist who likes to think about developmental stages, I'd be remiss if I didn't also note that normal developmental changes and transitions are also periods of uncertainty. So um, any time that your child starts to think about food allergies differently, and what I mean by that is if they have a better understanding of their food allergy from a medical component, <clears throat> or if they suddenly understand what illness means, if they understand um, what death is, all of these things can cause anxiety and uncertainty to, to pop up. And then transitions also are hard. So moving from daycare into school, maybe going to daycare for the first time is tricky. And then, of course, the adolescent transition is hard. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. So let's talk a little more then about why adolescence is such a period of difficulty um, in general, but then more specifically with respect to food, cha uh, food allergies. So during adolescence, there are brain changes, there are cognitive changes, and there are social changes. A lot of this has to do with puberty, um, and it, it's a period of a lot of um, stress and difficulty on both ends, both from parent and child perspective. Um, with respect to brain changes, one thing that we know is that this is a period of time during which the cerebral cortex thickens. And um, if that term's not familiar to you, just imagine looking at the brain. And the cerebral cortex is all of the gray matter that you see on the outside of the brain that's, that's wrinkled. It's the outermost layer. Um, it has lots of layers to it. Um, and this is the area that's really developing a lot during adolescence. There are several lobes of the cerebral cortex, things that manage vision, like the occipital lobe. Um, we have our temporal lobe, which helps us with hearing. And um, we have the parietal lobe, which is the spatial orientation lobe. But then the prefrontal cortex is really important during adolescence because it's responsible for what we call executive functioning. Um, and this is a category of activities that include things like attention and planning, organization, things like that. Um, so this, this is a huge period of growth for our adolescents. Neuronal pathways are also becoming more efficient. So that means kids are able to you know, think faster, they can process more. And there are specific changes that happen with respect to abstract thinking and logic and planning. So in those early adolescent years, 
we see that kids are able to think more abstractly um, so they can imagine things better, they can synthesize better because they can take other perspectives more easily. And they also have increases in metacognition, which ultimately is thinking about thinking. So you may find that during this period of time, kids can understand like, oh, I'm a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner. They understand how to learn better. They use mnemonics, things like that. In the second part of adolescence, that 15 to 17 years age range, we find growth in the frontal lobe that is helping with logic and planning. And this is great because this means that adolescents are now able to think more ahead for food allergy management, um, but everything else that's going on during adolescence can make this not quite as efficient or perfect as we might hope. Um, with respect to our cognitive changes, we've touched on this a little bit, but there's um, a developmental psychologist named Piaget who talked a lot about different types of thinking and stages of thinking. And during adolescence, um, we reach our, our fourth and final stage of cognitive development, and it's called the formal operations stage. This emerges around ages 12 to 16. It really varies by child, and this lasts throughout adulthood. And this is affecting what I've talked about previously, the abstract thinking and planning, and it also really affects systematic problem solving. So kids can put more pieces together, they can figure things out more on their own, and think through which solutions are best for a specific problem. Um, they do this through inferential reasoning, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, all of these things are exploding during this time period. However, we also have some changes that lead to adolescent egocentrism, so you know, thinking about oneself. And particularly relevant to food allergies are both the personal fable and the imaginary audience. Um, the personal fable might be something that you've heard of before, and this is when you will have a belief that events are controlled by a mentally constructed audio autobiography. What this essentially is, is that teens might think that their life is going to go in a certain way simply because that is the way that they want it to go, or that's the way that they've envisioned it to go. And so it might not be a thought in your child's mind that you know they are someone that could ever experience an allergic reaction. Their autobiography is that they will be able to go out with their friends, will be able to go to school, and they won't need to carry their epi or they won't need to ask questions because they just won't have an allergic reaction. That's not something that would happen to them. The imaginary audience might be something that's also familiar to you. And this is when um, when teens have this internalized set of standards that they get from watching peers and observing their peer group, and they alter their behavior based on how they think their friends perceive it. So it may be um, from a food allergy perspective that you have a teen that is very hesitant to carry um, an epinephrine auto-injector because they believe that everyone will see it. Even if that's not the case, they believe everyone will know. Or if they um, you know, aren't eating the same exact kind of bread, they might think that everyone sees that and narrowed in on that and is going to single them out because of that. So these are things that are definitely affecting food allergy management for some of our teens. We also have changes in friendships. So kids start to share their inner feelings and secrets. They're more knowledgeable about others' feelings. This is all because of that abstract reasoning change that they have. Friendships become more stable. They become um, better at negotiating conflicts. And there are changes in peer group structure as well. So we start to see the development of cliques and clouds. Um, there are reputation-based groups, so teens who identify with a group either because they want to or because everyone else kind of clumps them in that group. So maybe, you know, that's, um, those are the jocks versus those are, you know, the nerds, things like that. And there's this identity prototype that starts to develop. So the team starts to label other people and themselves as belonging to a group, and that starts to reinforce or help them create their own identity. It helps them understand who they are. And then, of course, what we always are thinking about with respect to food allergies is the tendency to engage in sensation seeking. So there's an, a desire.
desire to experience an increased level of arousal. So when we see kids starting to do, um, you know, a lot of things like um, experimenting with drugs potentially, with sex, they love to go and roller coasters, play, you know, video games, like all of this stuff is increasing arousal. And sometimes this is because they're trying to gain peer acceptance. Sometimes it's because they're trying to differentiate themselves from their parents. Um, but ultimately, it's behavior that may put them at risk for food allergy, um, re, um, food allergic reactions. And we also know that teens are spending more time with technology, of course, TV, music, video games, computers, their smartphones. Um, they spend more time with technology than they do in school. And so they're learning a lot from sources outside of school um, and getting a lot of information from peers via social media. So how does this relate to food allergy? Well, a big one is that the responsibility for food allergy management is shifting during this time from parent to teen. And as you may have noticed in your own household, teens and parents may have very different ideas about how to manage food allergies. They may disagree on um, you know, who needs to know about food allergies in the teen's life. They may disagree on when epinephrine is carried and where it, um, who is carrying it, things like that. We also know that because peer social situations are predominating and many of them involve food, there are going to be many situations that come up during which teens with food allergy need to disclose that they have food allergy or are going to need to manage their food allergies in the context of a peer group. And some teens might be hesitant to tell others about their food allergies. Some might forget or refuse to read food labels. They might not ask about ingredients. They might not want to carry epinephrine auto injectors. And some of this very much is related to peer norms, but some of it's also because they are still developing these executive functioning skills that I talked about before. So it may be that your teen has every intention to ask about a food label or to carry epi, but it's hard for them to plan and organize their activity in a way that will support that and that will encourage them to do that. And then, of course, the risk-taking behavior. And something that comes up a lot during, um, during therapy and clinic with my families is that we might have kids who ages 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 are incredibly vigilant about their food allergies and who do a wonderful job and we, we really view them as these models for other kids, but then suddenly they are a little bit less vigilant or they might take more risks. And parents sometimes think that means that their teen doesn't care. Um, it, it doesn't mean that they don't care. It just might mean that there are a lot of things going on affecting their food allergy management. So common psychosocial concerns that arise during this time um, are the following. I get a lot of these questions. How is it that I help my child cope with food allergy-related anxiety? How do I help my child navigate peer situations and bullying? How do I successfully transition food allergy management to my child? How do I prepare my child for college or living on his or her own? How do I manage my own anxiety? Um, all of these things are things that come up, and we'll touch on a couple of them. So I've mentioned several times now that I am a clinician and I do therapy with teens and parents that have food allergies. And um, what it is that that I do in therapy is all from a cognitive behavioral theoretical orientation. And the way that I explain this to families is that um, cognitions are our thoughts. And so thoughts and behaviors are very much related. And I tell them that I can teach them strategies that are behavioral things that they can do when they're feeling anxious to help them in the moment. But then I can also help them change some of their thoughts related to the situation. And when the two of those come together, they're able to really um, experience a decrease in anxiety. And I should note, too, that when working with families, our, my ultimate goal is not to make kids not vigilant to their food allergies or to not worry about them at all, because we know that we need to be vigilant to food allergies. Um, but we also know that too much vigilance and too much anxiety and worry about it can also be unhealthy because it can prevent kids from doing the things that they should be doing developmentally. Maybe 
they don't want to go to school anymore because they're concerned about the cafeteria or they don't want to eat in certain places that you know to be safe. Um, so it's all about finding a happy balance of being vigilant, engaging in food allergy management, but also doing those things that they should be doing at their age. So um, now that I have that sidebar, getting back to our CVP strategies. In therapy, there are several different things that I focus on. One of them um, that I think is really important is psychoeducation. So teaching kids about their food allergies again. And there are several reasons for this. One of them is that many children who have food allergies are diagnosed at a very young age. And it's a time when they just could not understand what food allergies were. They just couldn't, developmental limitations, um, communication limitations, all of that. And it's something that our providers and parents sometimes forget about. So I encourage them to re-educate their kids about food allergies as they get older because they might actually not have the information that you think they have. And that's one of the things that I will do in therapy with kids, is understand, like, well, what do you think about this? What do you know about this, et cetera. We also engage in self-monitoring. And I sometimes refer to this as detective work. So um, I'll encourage kids to start keeping track of, you know, what situations am I feeling most anxious in? What exactly did I do during that situation that helped you feel better or that made me feel worse. Um, and this is important to do in the beginning because we can look for patterns so that we can understand what we need to target in therapy. And over time, as we work on therapy, continuing to self-monitor allows us to track changes over time so we can see, is what we're trying working? Is it not working? Are there areas that are improving, et cetera? I also regularly teach relaxation strategies. So these are things like um, deep breathing, using visual imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, um, mindfulness approaches. A lot of the stuff are things that you yourself can do with your teens, that teens can do now, even without seeing a psychologist. There are lots of wonderful programs um, that you can get online or that you can get um, on your phone um, to help immediately. Another thing that I do is thought challenging. So we break down exactly what kids are thinking about in a situation that's making them anxious and start to um, address some of those. So if the child's thought is that um, every single time I'm in a social situation, I will have an allergic reaction, um, that's not exactly logical because it doesn't happen every single time. And so we help kids start to challenge that and ask questions. Well, is it every single time? What did I do last time? What worked last time? Even if I did have a reaction, what would I be able to do? How would I prepare myself? Um, who are my support people nearby that I can talk to? All of those things can be used in the moment to help decrease anxiety. And all of this is coupled with problem solving. So we identify what is it that kids are able to do in the moment um, that will help manage their food allergies. So do they have a food allergy action plan at school? If not, we put one in place. Um, how can that benefit them and when they're feeling nervous? And we, it's an iterative process. So if the first solution that we came up with that was an act that didn't work, then we go back to the drawing board and we reflect to develop those executive functioning skills so that kids can um, enact a different solution. With respect to peers, this is always a, a, a delicate conversation and is one that I encourage parents to talk about really openly with teens. Um, rather than having just a hard and fast rule that every single person needs to know about your food allergies, talk to your kids about what they think about that. Who do they think are the key people that need to know about their food allergies and why. Um, ask them about their concerns. It may be that we are assuming something that is, is inaccurate, or it may be that well, the last time that they told someone they were bullied or teased for telling them about their food allergies. That is definitely a deterrent from actively talking about food allergies with peers. So use open-ended questions and ask things like, how was your day? Um, you know, who did you eat lunch with today? What was it like the last time you told someone that you had food allergies? What was it like in the cafeteria today when you were getting lunch or when you sat at your table? 
things like that can really give you a lot of um, information rather than simply yes or no questions. Address concerns by helping teens problem solve and role play with them. So maybe they don't really know how to talk to someone about food allergies. You guys can practice that at home. Encourage teens to talk with peers in a natural way as well. Um, this will get them really far. And again, going back to these key peers, it may not be that every single person does need to know about food allergies, but you could definitely, as a parent, make an argument that you know your three best friends need to know because they are with you in the cafeteria every day, and they go to soccer camp with you, and they go to Girl Scouts with you. Those people have to know. Um, it's also the case that you know teachers need to know, coaches need to know, and that doesn't mean that your child has to get up and do a formal presentation like maybe they did in elementary school about food allergies. So giving teens a little bit of choice and helping them figure that out with you is a nice way to give them some control over the situation. Regarding coping with bullying, um, we do know that about a third of kids that have food allergies experience bullying related to their food allergies. And this is, um, you know, it's a very distressing statistic for us, but we do want to be cognizant of this. And um, there have been many times in clinic when I've asked how school is going or how things are going with peers, and teens will report they have been bullied or teased and parents didn't know about it. So again, asking open-ended questions about how your teen's day is going will get you really far. And if you find out that your teen has been bullied and that this is in particular an ongoing issue, then you need to start talking to other adults. So find out what the situation is from their perspective. Find out what the school bullying policy is. Um, equipping teens with the ability to avoid the bully, um, helping them use a buddy system, teaching them how to deal with frustration. All of this is going to help them cope with the bully. And it's important, too, to pay attention to social media as well, because we know that cyberbullying is a really big component of bullying in general. So we want to see you know, how are things going online? What, what are your friends talking about online? What are they posting? Again, using open-ended questions can be a great way to address this. And then because bullying can be related to other psychosocial outcomes like feeling sad, feeling um, anxious, low self-esteem, it's going to be important to make sure that your child has a really well-rounded set of peers. Um, so it's that means that if your child's doing extracurricular activities, that those activities should include some people who aren't in their normal school circle, because that will give them access to a broader peer group than the ones that are um, engaging in the bullying. Transition is, of course, a really big topic of conversation as well. And one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give about this is really to view transition as a series of steps. So you don't wake up one morning deciding, okay, this is the day that my, my daughter will be doing everything on her own. Rather, um, we need to be thinking about transition as a scaffolding um, activity. So um, this is something that you theoretically have started with your kids before you even knew it. So teaching them about their food allergies is preparing them um, to take on their own food allergy management. Um, having them go with you when you shop at the grocery store that, and seeing how you read labels, that's a way of teaching them. Talking in front of them with waiters or waitresses or school personnel about food allergies is a way that you've already likely been teaching them how to advocate for themselves and manage their allergies. So you've already been doing all of this, but if you want to think about it more formally at this point, what I would recommend doing is making a list of all the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis for food allergy management. Think about it, like even break it down into the most minute things. So, you know, I go to the grocery store and read labels, but I also read labels when I get home. So it's not just I read food labels, but where do you do those, how frequently do you do those, etc. And I would also include on that list things like I call the doctor, to make an appointment. I go to the pharmacy to pick up an epinephrine prescription. Clearly, these are things that we think your teen is going to be doing right now um, if they're in that younger age bracket. But as they're reaching um, you know, 
18, period of time when they're going to move out. These are things that they need to be prepared to do, so don't neglect all of those little details. So once you've made this list, think about ones that are kind of simple that you think your child can handle now based on their developmental level. And find a good time and place to discuss transition with your child. A good time and place is one where there aren't a lot of competing demands, so typically it's at home. And it's when people are feeling calm. Um, it's when people don't have homework to do or they're not making dinner. Um, they're not getting ready to go to basketball practice or dance practice. It's a calm time where you can dedicate a substantial amount of time. And use this time to discuss transition. Together, come up with a, a couple things that your child is going to be primarily responsible for. And I say primarily because that doesn't mean that you as a parent won't have oversight. It just means that your child is the first person to do something. So that might be you go to the grocery store together, your child looks at the label first, picks it up first, and then you do a second check on it and can provide feedback about you know, whether or not they missed anything or if they did it really well, et cetera. Um, as your child starts to get better at this, you can provide less oversight, but you still should be checking in. And it doesn't have to be as mathematical as this, but like an example is if you go to the grocery store, you know, twice a week, um, you know, maybe one day out of those two days eventually you're doing that oversight, but one day you're not. You're letting your child be the one to do it, something like that. And so over time, you start to then add other things to that list. So you're still having oversight, still making sure that they're ultimately safe, but you're giving more and more things primarily to your child. And then ultimately, you also want to be giving private time during allergy appointments and other medical appointments for your child to talk to your allergist about concerns. This is really crucial because children, once they transition to adult care, need to know how to interact and to ask questions and to talk with their providers. So your child needs to start having that role. And there may also be things that your child doesn't feel comfortable talking with about you um, in front of you. So giving private time with your child and the medical provider is highly encouraged at this point. Parent stress, of course, is also something that we think about a lot. And um, these are just some very brief things that you can think about. We could have an entire talk just on this. Um, but some things that you can think about doing are your own relaxation methods. So deep breathing to calm yourself down in stressful situations. Um, thinking about some of these mindfulness activities. Uh, there's a, a really wonderful app that even I use um, that's called Headspace. That's meditation that you go through every day just to get yourself prepared and give you a baseline calm so that during the day as things come up, you're able to address them. Using problem-solving techniques to manage situations that you can control is helpful. Many times we use problem-solving techniques in our head, but we don't write it down. And I actually would advocate for writing things down because then you are actually actively working on the task rather than doing it kind of in your head as you're driving somewhere and can dedicate time to it. Of course, there are going to be situations that you can't control, and that's where figuring out how you can react to it will help. And that's where some of the cognitive piece of CDT comes in. So how can you challenge your thoughts um, to help yourself feel a bit better about it? Expanding your network of support is helpful, and that's not only from an emotional side, but also an instrumental support side. So emotionally, of course, you want to have people that you can talk to and be stressed with, but there may also be ways to expand your network of instrumental support, and that is people that help you tangibly in your day-to-day -day life. So perhaps that's someone who picks up the kids for you after um, school because you know, you have to work late, or that may be someone that is able to do that last minute um, stop at the pharmacy if you're unable to do that. So that might be close family members who live nearby, friends, etc. Those things can really make a world of difference in your stress. And then taking time for yourself, of course, making sure that you read a book if you want, you know, have dinner with friends if you're able to, um, meditating, as I said, making sure you take a family vacation or even get away for the weekend uh, with a significant other or on your own. All of those things are helpful. 
So, um, so lastly, I have two case examples just to briefly give you a sense of what it is that I do in therapy. Um, and then after we're done talking about these kids, then we'll have time for questions. So my first case example is a boy named Adam, who is 11 years old, and he has milk, egg, and shellfish allergies, and he also has oral allergy syndrome, so he kind of gets itchy lips and itchy tongue when he has raw vegetables, like maybe carrots or lettuce. And he's always been described as a picky eater. And when Adam comes to me, he um, notes that he's experiencing OAS symptoms that make him worry he's having an allergic reaction. And as a result, he's gradually begun to restrict his food range. And over the last two months, he's lost five pounds, which is a big red flag that he's not eating enough. And he's nervous about new foods. And his parents indicate that when he comes home from school many times, his lunchbox is full or he hasn't eaten um, a lot of the food in it. And um, I'll note, of course, that this is a a patient that's an amalgamation of many patients. This is not anyone's real name. Um, but it does represent what, what I have definitely come to see clinically quite a bit. And so with someone like Adam, um, think about our cognitive behavioral strategies that I, that I mentioned before. The first thing that I do with Adam is that psychoeducation piece. So it's very likely the case that he doesn't know a lot about oral allergy syndrome. It may be the case that his parents don't know a lot about it either. So this is where I would work with the medical provider to find out what exactly um, his IgE-mediated allergies are versus foods that are likely to be causing oral allergy syndrome symptoms. And um, I also would work with the medical provider to make sure that I know what foods are definitely safe for him. And I would talk with Adam about what foods he's begun to restrict that might be in that safe category. So providing that psychoeducation is a crucial first component. He might also need some education again on um, what symptoms of an allergic reaction are like, what symptoms of OAS are like, and also what symptoms of anxiety are like, because many times this um, overlaps a lot. So think about it when you feel nervous, you might get uh, you know, like butterflies in your stomach, you might start breathing very heavily. You might feel a little funny in your chest and like a sweaty palm. All of that can easily be mistaken for an allergic reaction, especially by young kids who haven't had many of them before. So we provide this education. And then we start to do the monitoring that I talked about, so finding out when is he having these problems with which foods. And I will teach him some relaxation strategies, so we learn his deep breathing, we learn visual imagery, we find things that are really meaningful to him and construct positive stories about it, things he can use to distract himself. Um, many times I have kids use their phone um, video features to record common places in their environment that they can watch when they're feeling nervous. And we give them kind of this arsenal of things to help make him feel better in the moment. And we also give him his thought-challenging strategies, so helping him do detective work and asking himself, what's the likelihood of having a reaction? What's the likelihood that this is anxiety? What should I do? Um, et cetera. And then ultimately, in order to get some of the foods back into his diet, what we'll do is make a list of all the foods that he is not eating and the places that he's not eating, and we will rank them from most anxious to least anxious. And we start with the least anxious ones and work with kids so they can start introducing that back into their life, putting that in the context of their relaxation and cognitive strategies. So perhaps Adam is most nervous about um, eating a brand new food in the cafeteria, and he is least anxious about eating um, a salad which has lettuce and like a simple um, dressing that he's had before, all things that he's eaten before and been okay with, but just now feels nervous about. So we'll have him go home and use his strategies um, to help him through that, that salad process. Um, and over time, we work our way up the hierarchy, up that ladder, up the list of things that make him anxious until he feels more confident with those harder things. Um, so then Clara is another case example, and she's a 12-year-old girl diagnosed with peanut, tree nut, and sesame allergies. 
she had an allergic reaction recently for the first time in six years. She feels somewhat nervous about food allergy management, but also wants to have more independence. And she isn't sure if she wants all of her friends to know about her food allergies, but also wants to go to sleepovers. Um, I would say, just to take a step back to Adam, Adam's a really great example of a kid that I would work with over the course of several months in therapy one-on-one. -on -one. Clara, on the other hand, is an example of someone that it, you might work with for a couple of sessions to kind of problem solve some of those acute things that are going on. Um, right now, based on our presentation here, she really doesn't, doesn't seem like she needs a lot of ongoing therapy. It's just there are little things that they want to tweak in her family. So we would use the strategies that we talked about for transition here. So we find out, well, what are you nervous about? We use those open-ended questions. We then use psychoeducation as appropriate to fill things in. And then together with parents and um, Clara, we talk about what are the things that need to be done for food allergy managed in her life? And what is it that her parents are doing, that her teachers are doing, that she's doing? We break that all down and then decide how her parents can have oversight over what she's doing to make her feel better. And, make, and I would make suggestions about what she could slowly start to transition to her. And we emphasize, you know, like, it's okay to, you know, not know the right answer all the time. If you forget something sometimes, that's fine. We expect kids to make some mistakes, which is why we provide that oversight. And then we also have a really open conversation about her friends. So everything that I touched on before, you know, who is it that really needs to know? Well, if you're going to sleepovers, the parent clearly needs to know. Um, and there may be a couple of peers that need to know. And we would really talk through, um, see what she's comfortable with, see what mom's comfortable with in order to come up with some compromises. Um, but this is a, an incredibly individual process, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, but just having these open-ended conversations, having a starting place is good. We never end something by saying, well, this is the only option, this is the way you have to do it. Um, we, we know it's an iterative process. So my conclusions here would be that I, I want to emphasize that it's very normal to experience adjustment concerns. But it's equally, it's also important to monitor your team for these symptoms and seek help from a professional if it's needed. And um, what I would be looking for are changes in your child that seem outside the norm. So you know your child better than anyone else, of course. And you might notice, wow, my son is really not eating a lot of school suddenly. Well, it could be food allergy related, but there could also be other reasons. So probe that, see what's going on. Um, or it could be that, um, you know, your child suddenly is eating a lot less at home. Um, that could be entirely different than not eating at school. So monitor for changes in things like eating and nutrition, but also monitor for changes in emotion. So do you see that your child is feeling more frustrated than normal, more sad, more withdrawn, um, more nervous, more angry? And tease apart as much as you can whether or not this seems to be the context of normal teen development or if there's something else going on. And if you're not sure, this is when it's fine to, you know, call a psychologist and have a consultation. Find out if from someone else's perspective if your child needs a little bit more help. Um, in order to find a psychologist in your area, I would recommend a couple of things. One is just to ask the, your child's pediatrician or allergist who they recommend as they typically have, um, you know, lists of people that they refer to. You can also go through your insurance company's website in order to look for people in your network. And because there are not very many psychologists like me who specialize in food allergy, I would recommend that you look for psychologists that have experience with children, with anxiety, or with other health concerns as a lot of the things that we deal with in food allergy are similar in some ways to other chronic illness populations. So that is where I will leave us. We do have some time for questions. So Lynn, let me know what, um, what you'd like us to talk about. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we do have questions, so we're gonna try to get through as many of them as we possibly can before we, um, before we wrap up. And um, some really good diverse topics that I think apply to a lot of people. So. Um, 
one of the questions, and this is kind of related to the, the sleepover case that you just presented, um, there's a, uh, the, the attendee has a 15-year-old daughter who doesn't want to bring her epinephrine when going to friends' homes at night because nobody carries a bag with them, uh, so she doesn't have a way to carry it. Her solution is to say she won't eat. So how can this parent encourage um, her to bring a bag with her with her epinephrine when nobody else does? Mm -hmm. So that is a, a great question. And um, I guess the first thing that I would want to find out is um, it seems a little odd to me that no one else is bringing a bag of any sort for a sleepover. I would guess that they would be bringing a change of clothes or something else. Um, but I would start with this kind of open conversation, and it's really not acceptable to just say that you're not going to eat because there are many circumstances that can come up where things are unexpected. Um, so I would consider, you know, talking with the other parent of this, the one that's hosting the sleepover, to find out what the different activities are going to be, um, to see if maybe there's something that they could do that does involve, you know, bringing things over with them so that it seems more natural for everyone to have a bag with them. Um, and this is an example where, you know, the, the parent can kind of say that this is the rule. Um, it, it is fine to have house rules and to say that this is something that you just have to do. Um, and if that is the case, if it is something you just have to do, then talking with the teen about ways that they can explain why they have epi to the peers could be really helpful. So role playing some of that, um, talking about how to teach the peers about epinephrine usage. Maybe they would want to learn about it a bit more. Um, so it's tricky without knowing the full context of all of this, but I would start with those open-ended kind of um, questions. They actually just wrote in and said um, they mean for going out at night, and so my apologies. Not not a sleepover, but just social situations where they're going out at night. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even something like that, I think it's okay for parents to say, you know, this is what you have to do, this is our rule, and it, talking with the team about the fact that unexpected things do come up is really significant. Um, again, I would say that this is something that would take a lot more time to kind of talk through with the parents, so if that's something that they're struggling with, talk to the allergist about it, and maybe take some time during a medical appointment to review it a bit more in depth. Great. Um, another question came through uh, from a parent who, it's related to um, having shown their teenage daughter um, a recent commercial that is um, for, encourages epinephrine auto-injector usage, and it's a little bit, um, a little bit of shock value. It sort of includes, um, provides uh, perspective from the teen's perspective of mm -hmm. how you know, having a, an accidental uh, ingestion and then, you know, the hives and difficulty yeah, breathing and ultimately one. passing out. <laughs> so this parent showed it to their daughter because um, they thought it was important, but a lot of people have said uh, that she shouldn't, she shouldn't have let her see it. So um, just curious about thoughts on this. And I guess the line between, you know, showing, showing teens what could, you know, some of the risks that are, that are involved and, um, you know, I guess kind of towing that line of how much do we shelter them and how much do we share. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am familiar with this commercial and I've had several patients in therapy tell me it's very distressing for them to see it. And there's no easy answer to this, as seems to be the case with a lot of things that we talk about in the psych perspective, but um, I think it really depends on the child. So teens, of course, need to know what can happen, and we would be doing them a disservice if we did not tell them that anaphylaxis can be fatal. They need to know this. A younger child, that's not the language that you want to use with them, but a teen, that is appropriate. doesn't mean we need to be hammering this home with them every single day, but it's something as part of the psychoeducation that's important. For some teens, that is sufficient, just knowing that um, is the way of making them see how important this is. For others, they might be curious to see, you know, like what might it be like to have an allergic reaction if they've never seen it happen. And in that case, watching this commercial could be useful. But um, but it does sometimes cause anxiety. And if you are going to show it to your child, I think you need to be prepared to have a conversation afterwards about what was going on, what their thoughts were on it. This should not be something that's done in like a two-minute sit-down. It needs to be the right time and place. Um, 
so it is very individual. My overall sense would be that we want our kids to know that these reactions can be fatal, but that um, we don't want to be overly scaring them such that they don't feel comfortable going anywhere and, and eating outside the home. Great, thank you. Sort of a similar question um, in terms of the gray areas. Um, how can parents know what an okay or normal level of anxiety, stress, and anger and angst is for a tween or a teen and what everyone goes through at that age versus when it's an unhealthy level stemming from food allergy stresses? Um, this particular parent mm -hmm. feels like they sometimes jump in too fast with their 12-year-old and don't give um, any, norm any space to be a normal teenager <laughs> with normal teenager angst. Mm -hmm. Yes, and teasing that apart is very challenging. Um, so again, there's no easy way to know. I would say that you know when you have a 12 year old, you've had 12 years to kind of see what your child generally acts like, what their baseline is. And we know, of course, that during adolescence, emotion regulation is challenging and difficult, and teens are figuring that out. And this is where I would look a lot to you know, like how are other classmates doing? How are other kids with food allergies doing? It gives parents one a sense of like what's going on in general and how does my child kind of compare to that. Um, if, it's okay like if, if you feel that you're jumping in all of the time, it's okay to take a time and step back and see what happens. Your child might deal with it fine, but they might also really need assistance. Anytime that you have a question about whether or not your child is experiencing too much anxiety or too much frustration, indicates that there is a little bit of a, you have a little bit of a concern, and it's okay to have a consultation with a mental health professional or with an allergist who has a lot more information and background knowledge about food allergies. Um, they would be giving you then a better sense of what it is that is going on um, and can make a more long-term referral. I definitely tell parents that coming to see me once is not a commitment to seeing me for months or a year. It could just be that they need, you know, a second opinion on things. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for just about one more. Um, this is a really quick one, though, uh, Linda. Just what it, what it, what was the name of the app for relieving parent stress that you had mentioned? Oh, it's called Headspace. Um, H e a e s p a c e. It's a meditation and mindfulness app that you can use daily. Um, and I personally use it. I like it a lot. They're about 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minute meditations. But there are a lot that are out there and um, you know, I can't speak to all of them, of course, because there are many, but look at reviews. There's, there's some really great ones. There's another one that I recommend um, as well. It's called Relax Melodies, and it's an app. I'm not sure if it's on Android, but it's at least on Apple products, and it's, it's kind of like a white noise machine that is customizable, so you can come up with combinations of sounds that are relaxing to you. Um, so, for example, when I use it, um, I happen to like brainstorms and wind chimes. So I like this combination of those things. But you can do like background city noise, you can do ocean waves, all kinds of things. Great. And just as a quick follow-up to that, are there any sort of um, tools, like an online tool or apps or anything like that, that, you, that can serve as like an immediate tool for an anxious child, something that helps? Um, that helps with the immediate practice of the common behavior, would you recommend the same app or anything different for, for the teens? So the Relax Melodies is really great. Um, I think that just having, like if in the moment, like if you're not sure you're going to need something, just pulling out something that will distract your child can be really helpful. So pulling out like a drawing app, pulling up like calming pictures, looking at pictures of family, things that are cheerful or great. Um, but just encouraging your child to like start documenting, like fun, happy places um, can be nice. So then they have like a slideshow that's all ready for them. They have calming videos that are really meaningful to them. Um, all of that is a place to start. Okay, great. Do you have time for just one more before we go? I know that we're a little bit over time. Sure. But I want to, okay. Sure. Um, just because this one comes up quite often, um, how do parents bring up the topic about kissing and relationships with their teenagers? Mm -hmm. So the first point of that is just to know whether or not your child actually is in um, a relationship or is thinking about that. And so asking those open-ended questions about peers is helpful, like, oh, tell me, who are you hanging out with now? Um, you know, what are your friends' names and what are you guys doing? That can give you a sense of whether or not those relationships are starting. Um, but then 
when you think about doing your basic food allergy education, it's possible to talk about it not starting with talking about kissing, but talking about this contact with other people and saying things like, um, all right, like, just so you know, like, sometimes if people are sitting near you, they might touch you and have um, allergen on them. I feel like the same thing happens when people get older. Maybe you want to hold hands with a significant other. Um, perhaps they want to kiss you on the cheek or if you want to kiss them, um, you know, more intimately, those are things that we want to be concerned about. And you can use examples that sound really silly, but things like, you know, when your dog had that peanut butter Kong and licked your arm, like that made you have hives or you had like a skin reaction of some sort. It's the same thing when interacting with kids, the same thing when being in a relationship and, and kissing someone. Um, so I would, I would start by using those open-ended questions, asking about peers and kind of building up to it. Um, if it's something that you really don't feel entirely comfortable with doing on your own, that's something that you can bring up in an allergist office and just um, see if the allergist might have a nice way to kind of dig into that as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I know that we did get, we, we got to a few questions that, that came through, but we unfortunately won't have time for, but I would encourage anybody that has those questions, um, if you want to send them along to me, um, you can email me directly um, using the webinar emails that you've received for as reminders um, leading up to this, and just go ahead and send them along to my attention, and um, we'll try to address them and, and pass them along to, to Dr. Herbert and try and get um, responses to everybody that hasn't had their questions answered here. Um, but I really want to thank you, Dr. Herbert, for being here today, um, offering some really important insights to our parents and um, and as they're working with their teens and their adolescents and addressing some really important topics um, that are affecting our teens right now. Um, You're welcome. It's my pleasure. And in case anybody missed any portion of the presentation, um, just a quick reminder, because we get this often when folks come in late, is it going to be recorded? Yes, today's webinar has been recorded, and it will be available as a resource on FAIR's website in the coming days. Um, after this webinar, and in your post-webinar follow-up email from FAIR, a short survey link will also be included for you to share feedback on today's presentation and to provide comments on webinar topics you'd like to see in the future. So if you could, please take a minute to complete this and just help us continue to deliver meaningful information through our webinar series. For our next webinar, which um, will actually be two weeks from today, we'll be joined by Jim Long, former senior attorney with the Office for Civil Rights, also known as OCR, um, with the U.S. Department of Education and uh, current principal at, the education, at Educational Rights Consulting. And uh, Jim will be addressing the fundamentals regarding the application of Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, which are both laws designed to protect individuals with disabilities to the post-secondary setting, meaning colleges and universities. The emphasis is going to be on arming qualified students with allergies severe enough to be considered disabilities with information to um, enable them to negotiate the policies and procedures and processes for obtaining um, what are called academic adjustments, and that includes modifications to school policies, accommodations, and supports. So we're going to address the laws, definition of disabilities, schools' responsibilities, and the responsibilities of individual students with, uh, with food allergies documentation issues, and then participating in the interactive process with schools. So note that the timing of this webinar is going to be extended beyond our normal hour-long presentation in order to allow time for um, some pretty uh, lengthy content and as well as some, some Q&A session, and uh, that this webinar will be held two weeks from today, as I mentioned before, on Wednesday, July 27th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, those of you who are FAIR members have already received an email um, inviting you to register for this webinar. So um, early registration for FAIR members is already open, but we will be opening general registration for this webinar tomorrow on Thursday, July 14th. And you can go ahead and register um, using the link that is at the bottom of this slide. Um, you can also access any of our webinar archives there as well. Um, that will conclude today's webinar, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Herbert, for joining us, and thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you again um, for our next webinar presentation. Have a great day.